Having the confidence and knowledge to rebuild the top end of an engine is an excellent skill to have. And it's something you can do without the need for specialist tools and save yourself a lot of money in the process. And in today's video, I'm gonna cover everything you need to know step by step to give you the confidence to rebuild your engines at home. And I'll be demonstrating this process on a still MS660. It's one of the largest chainsaws they make, but the best part is it doesn't matter what engine you're working on, two stroke or four, the same principles apply across the board. So regardless if you're working on a lawnmower, a hedge trimmer, or your motocross bike, the fundamental principles of this video still apply. The cylinder's been really well cleaned, as well as the piston. And the way I did that was just a little bit of Scotch-Brite, carefully and meticulously going over the crown of the piston. Don't rub it on the sides, on the skirts, unless it's really bad and really carboned up. And then I used a scouring pad in the exhaust port to clean all that up. And we've got a really great finish there. And then I used a little bit of Scotch-Brite in the cylinder crown just to make sure that there's no loose carbon that could release and end up scoring my piston. It really is worth the time taken. Get it clean, get it all ready for assembly, and that way you're not gonna run into any problems later down the line. Whenever you're storing your piston and cylinder on a rebuild, always install the piston and rings inside the cylinder. This can help to eliminate broken rings, scratches, and damage to either part. Before we place the gasket down, we're gonna go over all the mating surfaces with some brake cleaner. It only takes a small amount of dirt or debris between the mating surfaces to create an air leak, and a two-stroke is completely reliant on a sealed crankcase. My recommendation with cleaning like this is to use a white rag and don't stop until it comes out as clean as it went in. Gaskets that have a ridge like this often have an orientation, whether that face up or face down. So do check the service manual as to which way it should go. In this case, that ridge face is down. The next step is to install one of the two circlips onto the piston before the piston goes on the connecting rod and always choose the side that's gonna be more difficult to access when the two are connected. In this case, I'm gonna use the circlip installation tool, but it's unlikely that you're gonna have one at home. And therefore, I've actually done a video on how to install circlips with nothing other than a pick. I'm gonna link that into the description below, as well as the other videos that I've mentioned so that you've got those to refer to as and when necessary. Next, we apply a small amount of oil to the bearing. That's just two stroke oil, and that goes into the small end of the connecting rod. We take our piston and place that over the bearing and ensure the alignment is as per the manufacturer's specification. In this case, it's with the alignment dowels or alignment pins for the piston rings facing the intake and with the small arrow facing the exhaust. However, I've had it where there's no arrow and also where the alignment pins are facing the exhaust themselves. This isn't common, but it can happen, so don't automatically assume the piston's orientation. We then take the gudgeon pin, again a small amount of two-stroke oil here. This goes through the side of the piston, and then we align the piston, bearing, connecting rod, and pin together, and this can take a little bit of fiddling. It's not necessarily the easiest, especially on camera. And the last step now is to install the last circlip. Again, we're gonna use the tool, but it can be done safely and effectively with just a pick. And more two-stroke oil in the cylinder. You can never have too much when assembling an engine. Same on the piston as well. So next we need the piston ring compressor. Now you can do this by hand, you don't need this tool, but it just makes your life a little bit easier. Then we're gonna align each one of the piston rings with their locating pins. The piston ring compressor goes over the top and just below the crown of the piston, because that helps for alignment in a minute. Pinch them together gently and just turn back and forth until those piston rings align correctly. And next we take our cylinder, place it over the top, fingers underneath the piston, and just gently locate it home. Ring compressor can be pulled out here. And then we'll slide that all the way down. And we're on. The next stage is a pressure and vacuum test. Now, although we've put in new gaskets and new seals, it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't faulty from the factory. So we have to block off the intake, and in this case, I'm using a specific OEM tool. You don't have to, you can use rubber inner tube, just like I'm using on the muffler to block off the exhaust port. And then we have to block off the spark plug hole. In this case, we're putting a spark plug in it. And then the decompression valve as well. Bring the crankcase up to around about five PSI. Oh. 
and if it holds, we then take it through the vacuum process, which is about 15 inches of mercury, and we want to ensure that that needle doesn't drop either way. The last stage is to actually rotate the crankshaft while the engine's still under vacuum. I've had it many times before where it will actually hold 15 inches of mercury while the crankshaft is stable, but as soon as it's rotated, it will actually start to leak. Slightly hardened seals can cause this, bearing play can cause it as well, and unless you rotate that crankshaft, you're really not gonna get a true representation as to the condition of that seal, the bearing, or the engine's function itself. What a great place to be. The bottom end rebuild is done, the top end rebuild is done, the pressure and vacuum test has just validated all of that effort and time we've put in so far. And now it's a case of putting on the flywheel, coil, clutch, and then the plastics to complete this rebuild. To install the flywheel, we need to stop the piston from moving up and down. And my favorite method is to use some rope. So you're currently looking through the spark plug at the exhaust port, and I rotate the crankshaft until the piston closes that exhaust off like so. And now I can install my piston stop. And in my drawer, I always keep a piece of rope. This is just some pull cord. We fold the rope in half, and that rope acts as my piston stop. And the reason why I like the rope is because it stops the piston from getting damaged if you were to use, say, a metal piston stop, or if you use a plastic piston stop, they can actually break. And the reason why I like to put a bend in this rope is if I was to accidentally catch it in a port and it get cut, I can tell straight away. If I put a loose frayed end in there, I wouldn't know. Then the flywheel goes on, and we align that with its key and flywheel nut goes on and we torque it down. In this case, it's 33 foot pounds, but do check your service manual because every machine and every flywheel nut is different. When we install the ignition coil, we need to make sure that we have the right space between the coil and the flywheel. And with the coil just installed without any tension or torque on the bolts, I place the gauge in between the armature of the coil and then I rotate the flywheel until the magnets align with the coil itself. From here, I now can tighten up those bolts. And then lastly, I'm gonna rotate the flywheel around and take out my gauge. The next job is the clutch. And we have a whole bunch of bits to go back on. So we start off with the oil pump first. And that has two M4 bolts in this case. This is the oil pump worm gear and it's got a little bronze bushing in there. I'm gonna apply a small amount of grease to that, as well as the threads on the outside. And that goes on next. Next, we put the guard washer down, and this has top written on it. And the reason we have this washer is to protect the oil pump if the clutch were to let go. Next, the clutch goes on, but as mentioned, remember this is a reverse thread, so lefty tighty righty loosey. And sadly, I don't have a torque wrench that works on left-hand thread, so I'm just going to take an educated guess and go to about there. Next, we're going to grease the idler bearing. And that goes on. Next, we install the clutch drum. Now, this has little notches in it, and those are to align with the worm gear for the oil pump. So just make sure when you do put them on that you put it on in line and that it sits all the way down. Next step is the rim sprocket, goes on, washer, and then lastly, your circlip. The final stage is to install the chain brake mechanism. Now, my advice is if you've taken the machine apart, just make sure you take photos. If not, and you do forget, just use the service manual. But once you've done a few, it's fairly simple to do. The carburetor is one of the final parts I need to Clean, inspect, and then assemble onto the saw. Moment of truth. Diaphragm soft. Nice. Oh, look at that. Spotlessly. Oh, I love it. I just love it when that happens. Right, I'm not even going to touch that side. I'm going to leave well alone. I'm not even going to check the passages or anything. You know I'm going to come back to this in about an hour once I've tested it and it's not running properly, but I will take the risk. So we need to go that way. This is going to go back on. Are we going to be lucky on the fuel pump side? This side's generally dirtier because it's only been through one screen, whereas the metering side, you have two screens before you can get to it. 
Oh, that's actually not bad at all. That's the second screen I'm referring to. That's not so great. So we'll give that a wash out. That's not going to take much. And I will just take this screen out and go through with some carb cleaner and make sure that's flowing correctly. The easiest way to do that I've found is using a utility knife. Comes out every time. So we're going to put the small screen in place. Diaphragm goes on next. And then the gasket and the cover plate. Then we snug up the screws. And then last but not least, we're going to do a pressure test. And this tests whether the gaskets are holding and whether the needle's holding. It also tests the fuel inlet barb that it's not leaking as well. And around about 5 to 7 PSI is all we need. That's good. It's exciting. We're getting close to finishing the rebuild. So the handlebar is the next part to go on. And this just slots in like so. We have screws that go in to hold the plastic housing on. These are only going into plastic, so don't ever do it. Two more this side. There's a sneaky one hidden next to the intake manifold. Carburetor goes on next. And take hold of the linkage. Finger goes behind the carburetor and you can feed the linkage in place. And the fuel line goes on next. I'm often asked what fuel ratio I run in a two-stroke. If I'm just running chainsaws, then I'll run 32 to 1. But because I repair so many different pieces of outdoor power equipment and each one sees a different amount of load, I tend to go with 50 to 1 AMS or Sabre. And for bar oil, this is just still oil here. And uh, it's not as important running a really high quality bar oil as it is running a good quality two-stroke oil. Before we get too carried away, let's uh, give it a test run at home. Otherwise we might get to the woodlot and find out that we have some problems. <laughs> 